Welcome back to another episode of Smooth Brain EDH, where we make the smoothest plays with the biggest brains. We have a really special episode for you all today. For this video, we're showcasing some of the new commanders from Modern Horizons 2. This set is poised to shake up every format it's legal in, and Commander is no exception. Starting off, we have Cody, playing as Zabaz the Glimmer Wasp deck. This Boros deck is an artifact deck focused around the modular ability. His starting hand has a snow-covered mountain, a Rustvale Bridge, City of Brass, Dispatch, Arcbound Javelinier, Umazawa's Jite, and Council's Judgment. Next in the turn order is Ethan, piloting Lanus, Cryptozoologist. This Simic deck capitalizes on powerful into the battlefield effects and the investigate mechanic to create a lot of value. The deck also has a slight thievery sub theme, stealing its opponent's non lane permanents and spells. His opening hand contains two islands, a city of brass, arbor elf, elvish mystic, floodhound, and mines dilation. Third, we have Chandler, piloting his Thrasta, Tempest's Roar deck. This is a mono green stompy deck that can leverage his commander's cost reducing ability to create infinite mana with food chain. His opening hand has a forest, wooded foothills, veil of summer, lotus cobra, rampant growth, search for tomorrow, and natural order. Last up is Cameron, piloting his general Ferris Rockerick deck. This deck is focused around casting multicolored spells to trigger its commander's ability in order to build an army of golems. His starting hand has a Plains, Rustvale Bridge, Sunhome, Fortress of the Legion, Liquid Metal Torque, Prismatic Lens, Wear Terror, and Jorkadine the Prevailer. Now that we've seen the hands, let's not waste any more time and jump straight into the gameplay. Thank you very much, Ethan. As you said, let's hop right in. As was stated, Cody wins the die roll and starts off with a snow-covered mountain into his commander, Zabaz. He then passes to Ethan. Ethan starts his turn off with a City of Brass, taking one to it to cast Elvish Mystic. He then passes to Chandler. Chandler plays a Forest as his lane for turn, and then taps for one to suspend Search for Tomorrow. He then passes to Cameron. Cameron plays a tapped Rustvale Bridge and passes to Cody. And it's at this point Cody and Cameron realize that they are quote Boros buddies, end quote. Cody plays his own City of Brass, and then taps it for a white to cast Arcbound Javelinier. He takes one damage to it. He then moves to combat, swinging one commander at Chandler, who takes it. He then passes to Ethan, who plays an Exotic Orchard as his lane for turn, and then casts his commander, Lawness. He then casts a Floodhound, and Lawness triggers, making him a clue token. And I would also like to apologize for the glare. We almost always play at Cody's house, and he is currently in the process of moving into a new place. With there not being too much room, we didn't notice that one of the lights was a little too close until after we checked this footage. But moving on, Ethan passes to Chandler, and Chandler removes his suspend counter from Search for Tomorrow. He then plays a Wooded Foothills, then casts the Soul Ring he drew for turn. He then fetches for a forest with Wooded Foothills, and then casts a Lotus Cobra. He passes to Cameron after this, who plays a Plains, and then casts Liquid Metal Torque. He passes to Cody after this. Cody plays a Plains as his land for turn, then tasks for two to cast Umizawa's Jite. He passes to Ethan after this. Ethan plays an Island as his land for turn, and then starts off by evoking a Moldrifter to draw two cards. He also gets to investigate off of Lanus. He then takes another damage to City of Brass to cast an Arbor Elf, making another clue token. He then passes to Chandler, who gets to cast Search for Tomorrow, finding another forest to the battlefield. He then plays yet another forest as his land for turn. Lotus Cobra makes a green. He then uses that, another forest, and Soul Ring to cast Natural Order, sacrificing Lotus Cobra. Chandler decides to get a value creature and puts Elder Gargaroth to the battlefield. After this, he casts Rampant Growth to find another forest to the battlefield tapped. After this, he passes to Cameron. Cameron plays a mountain as his land for turn, then casts his commander, General Ferris. He then passes to Cody. Cody plays a windswept heath as his land for turn, then immediately equips his commander with the Jite. He then takes a damage to City of Brass to give his commander flying. After this, he moves to combat and swings at Ethan. Ethan takes it and Cody gets two counters on his Jite. He then passes to Ethan. Ethan plays another island, then taps for three to cast Academy Manufacturer. Not wanting Ethan to get the free ETB tokens off of it, Cody responds by removing two counters from Jite to give Lanus neg 2 neg 2. Ethan responds to that by sacrificing three treasures and activating Lanus' ability. Ethan gets Goblin Welder off the top three cards of his library. He also investigates off of it entering, but he realizes that later. 
He then casts a Chrome Mox, imprinting an Eternal Witness, then passes to Chandler. Chandler starts his turn off by casting a Summoner's Pact. He finds a Beast Whisperer to his hand, and then casts said Beast Whisperer. He then casts Ornithopter for zero, drawing a card off Beast Whisperer. He then plays a Forest as his land for turn, and casts Thrasta for three mana, drawing another card off of Beast Whisperer. He then moves to combat, swinging Thrasta at Cameron, and Elder Gargaroth at Cody, and he draws a card off of Elder Gargaroth's attack trigger. And after this, Chandler passes to Cameron. Cameron plays a Sun Home as his land for turn, then casts his Prismatic Lens. After this, he just passes to Cody. Cody plays a Mountain as his land for turn. He then gives his commander flying again and swings at Ethan. Cody gets two more counters on his Jitte and then passes to Ethan. But on his end step, Ethan activates Floodhound to investigate. And thanks to Academy Manufacturer, he gets one of each token, treasure, clue, and food. After this, he decides it's time to drop Mind's Dilation. He then passes, and on his end step, Chandler knocks her survivals, paying two life to return natural order to the top of his library. Mind's Dilation triggers, and Ethan gets a 0 0 Stone Coil Serpent. And of course, it immediately dies. Still on instep, Cameron decides to cast both sides of Wear Tear, targeting the Mind's Dilation and Academy Manufacturer. Cameron makes a 4 4, and Ethan gets the top card of Cameron's library, which is an Aurelia, and Ethan gladly takes that. But Cody doesn't want Ethan to have that, so he dispatches it with Metalcraft active. The instep finally actually ends, and we move to Chandler's turn. And Chandler pays for his pact. He immediately moves to combat again, swinging 7 commander again at Cameron, and then 6 with the Gargaroth at Ethan this time. He draws a card off the Gargaroth trigger. He then casts a Lifecrafter's Bestiary and passes to Cameron. Cameron plays a Great Furnace as his land for turn, then taps for 3 to cast a Blade Splicer, making another Golem. Now all of his Golems have Verse Strike. He then passes to Cody who, on his end step, cycles a Sojourner's Companion. He finds a Darksteel Citadel to his hand. He then taps for 2 taking one to his city, and cast together forever. It's support two triggers, and he puts the two counters on the only two creatures he has. He then moves to combat, swings his commander at Cameron, then gives it flying, and Cameron takes the two damage, and Cody gets two more counters on his GTA. He then passes to Ethan, but on his end step, Ethan activates Goblin Welder to get rid of his food token to get back his Academy Manufacturer. And while he can't exactly stop the trigger once it's on the stack, Cody does decide to remove a counter from GTA to kill the Welder. And so Ethan gets back a very shiny and glary Academy Manufacturer. And so on his turn, Ethan decides it's time to tap for 4 and recast Lonis. He then casts an Airwald Illuminator, and when it enters the battlefield, it lets him investigate twice, thanks to his commander. And thanks to Academy Manufacturer, he actually gets two treasure tokens and food tokens as well. And after this, Ethan passes to Chandler. On his turn, Chandler decides to top the scry from the bestiary, which turns out to be a Toski, which he casts. He draws a card off the Beast Whisperer, and pays one to draw a card off the Bestiary. He then moves to combat, and Cody tells Chandler if no creatures swing at him, he will not kill Toski with the Jitte this turn. And so Chandler decides that the best swing would be Thrasta and Gargaroth at Ethan this turn. Ethan does not block, of course, and Chandler is able to draw three cards, two off Toski, and one off Gargaroth's attack trigger. Chandler then decides that his Gargaroth has outlived its usefulness, so he Eldritch evolutions it to go get an Avenger of Zendikar. He gets 6 plant tokens, and then immediately plays a Misty Rainforest to trigger that landfall. He then just passes to Cameron. Cameron starts his turn off by casting Forging the Tyrite Sword, making a treasure token, and another 4-4 Golem. Cameron then passes to Cody, and on his end step, Cody activates Together Forever, targeting his Javelinier, then activates the Boz, destroying the Javelinier. It gets returned back to his hand, and Modular triggers, putting all the counters on Zabaz, plus 1. Then on his turn, Cody recasts the Javelinier, accidentally tapping a red, but he fixes that in just a second. Cody then decides it's time to cast Council's Judgment. Chandler decides before it resolves and they get rid of the Avenger of Zendikar, it's time to fetch with the Misty Rainforest to get that second landfall trigger. Everyone agrees to go ahead and vote for the Avenger, and so that's what they do. Everyone votes for it, and it is exiled. Cody then reactivates Together Forever and Zabaz to destroy the Javelinier, putting two more counters on Zabaz and returning the Javelinier to his hand. Cody then removes a counter from Jite to kill Toski, and then moves to combat, swinging Zabaz at Chandler. And Chandler, not realizing that Cody didn't give Zabaz flying, blocks with his Ornithopter. After this, Cody then relinquishes his turn to Ethan. And now on Ethan's turn, he thinks for a little bit and decides to tap for four and cast a Panharmonicon. Everyone's a little worried about the tokens he could potentially make, but he just passes to Chandler. And Chandler decides to start his turn off with a Rishkar's Expertise drawing seven cards and casting a spell from his hand, CMC 5 or less. 
He decides to cast the Natural Order. He returned to the top of his library a few turns ago, sacrificing a plant token. He decides to find an Ashaya, Soul of the Wild, to the battlefield. And while thinking of what to do next, Cody mutters something about being able to kill Chandler next turn, and so that changes what Chandler's going to do. He casts a Finale of Devastation, X is equal to 3, finding a Reclamation Sage to the battlefield, destroying Cody's commander. Cody responds by tapping City of Brass for a mana, taking a damage to activate together forever, so that when Zabaz dies, it gets returned to his hand. Chandler then moves to combat, swinging 7 commander at Cody. After this, he passes to Cameron and discards 4 lands on his cleanup phase. And on Cameron's turn, he makes another treasure, thanks to the Saga. And then he decides to drop Jorkadeen. With Metalcraft active, all of his creatures get plus 3 plus 0. Cameron then tries to decide where he wants to swing his 6 and 7 power golems, but Ethan and Cody remind Cameron that Chandler has drawn several cards the past few turns and probably has a pump spell. Seeing as there could be a huge crackback if he swings out, he decides to hold back his golems as first strike blockers. And so, he passes to Cody. And on Cody's turn, he finally plays his Rustvale Bridge. After this, he recasts his commander and his Javelinier. He then re-equips his Jitae to his commander, and then re-loops his Zabraz Together Forever mini combo. Cody then passes, and on his end step, Ethan flashes in Venser, bouncing Cameron's Saga, and Chandler's Ashaya with the Panharmonicon double trigger. And again with the Panharmonicon, Ethan gets to investigate twice with his commander, and with the Erdball Illuminator, he gets to investigate a third time. And of course, with the Manufacturer out, all these tokens come in as three treasures, food, and clue tokens. Now finally on Ethan's turn, he plays a Forest's Land for turn. He then immediately activates Lannis, targeting Chandler, sacrificing six clue tokens. He decides to steal a Wood Elves off the top six cards of Chandler's library, getting to search for two forests, and getting to investigate three times. He then taps two mana to sacrifice a clue token and draw a card. He then casts Noxus Revival to put Mold Drifter on the top of his library. He then cracks a clue to draw said Mold Drifter. He then evokes Mold Drifter, and draws now four cards and investigates twice. He then casts a Coiling Oracle, investigating twice again and getting two Coiling Oracle triggers. The first one reveals ongoing investigation, and the second is a Temporal Spring. He then casts his own Wood Elves to go get two more forests and investigate twice again. He then attempts to Soul Bond a Deadeye Navigator to his Venser. Because he'll be getting two treasure tokens every time he blinks Vencer, he can loop this until everyone's permanents are bounced. And so before Deadeye Navigator hits the battlefield, Cody removes two counters from Jitae to kill the Vencer. The Deadeye Navigator enters the battlefield, and Cody then realizes the Coiling Oracle being soul bonded could be a problem. And everyone realizes that because of Lannis, the manufacturer and Panharmonicon, Ethan can essentially draw his entire deck. And so, in response to the Soul Bond trigger, Cody decides to remove two counters and kill the Lawness, but not the Coiling Oracle. Ethan still decides to Soul Bond to the Coiling Oracle, and unfortunately, amidst this chaotic board state, misses that he should have investigated twice when Deadeye Navigator entered the battlefield. After all this, Ethan decides to Temporal Spring Cody's commander to the top of his library. Cody just puts it back in the command zone. And after one super long turn, Ethan passes to Chandler, and everybody thinks the combo has been stopped. And Chandler, now worried that an army of golems is going to come after him, decides to Kindrith Transformation, the Jorkadeen. He draws a card off of its ETB trigger. He then casts an Eternal Scourge, drawing a card off Beast Whisperer and paying a green to Lifecrafter's Bestiary. He then casts a Tireless Tracker, drawing another card off of the Beast Whisperer, and also paying a green to the Bestiary. After this, he plays a Prismatic Vista and cracks it to find a forest to make two clue tokens. And unfortunately still not finding his food chain, he passes to Cameron, who responds on his end step by Chaos Warping the Kenris Transformation. The top card of Chandler's library, after being shuffled, is a forest, so he puts it onto the battlefield and makes another clue token. Now on his turn, Cameron casts a Lash Heal. He then recasts his Forging the Tyrite Sword, making another treasure token, and he gets another 4-4 Golem off this. Cameron then moves to combat and swings three 7-4 Golems and one 6-3 Golem at Ethan. Ethan declares blocks with Floodhound, both of his Wood Elves, and Coiling Oracle, but before damage, activates Deadeye Navigator's ability to blink Coiling Oracle. He will get to investigate three times, but he also takes a damage to a City of Brass. He also gets two Coiling Oracle triggers, the first of which is a Polluted Delta, which he puts to the battlefield, and the second is a Tranquil Thicket, which he also puts to the battlefield. Cameron then casts a Steel Overseer and then passes to Cody. On Cody's turn, he recasts his commander, re-equips Jitae, and then casts an Arcbound Ravager. He then passes to Ethan, who fetches for a tapped breeding pool on his end step. 
And on Ethan's turn, big surprise, he recasts his commander and tries to restart his combo. And so, because of the Panharmonicon and the Academy Manufacturer, every time Ethan blinks this Coiling Oracle, he will make two more treasure tokens to repeat the process. And since it is Coiling Oracle, every time it re-enters the battlefield, he gets to reveal the top card of his library, put it to his hand, or put it onto the battlefield, if it's a land. Ethan then has Cameron count all the cards in his library, which was 73, and so Ethan continues this process until he has 73 clue tokens. Along the way, he casts a Graph Mole, then finds, casts, and equips a Lightning Greaves. He also reveals a Rise and Shine, and everybody now realizes what he's trying to do. He then activates Lawness, sacrificing 73 clue tokens, essentially going to get anything in Cameron's deck. He finds Alibu from Cameron's deck, giving all other artifact creatures haste, and then overloads the Rise and Shine. All of his food, clue, and treasure tokens become 4-4s with haste, and nobody has enough blockers to handle that, so everyone concedes, and Ethan is the winner. Hey there guys, how you doing? Thanks for watching again, and I hope you enjoyed the new Modern Horizons 2 Commanders. I certainly enjoyed editing and watching this video. The threat assessment on that last turn was a little iffy, which let Ethan get the win, but the outcome was pretty fun if you ask me. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like and don't forget to subscribe. Also, we love hearing from you in the comments. Don't forget to check us out on social media, links will be in the description, as well as the deck lists. And one last thank you before I wish you a smooth day.